Hi, good afternoon. This is our fifth set of notes from Chapter 7, uh, VLE of Peer Components. In this set of notes, we're going to introduce our new auxiliary function, uh, Fugacity. Okay. And where we ended in our last set of notes was uh, we introduced chemical potential, and we saw that we could rewrite our criteria phase coexistence as equality of temperatures, pressures, and chemical potential. Then we ended by asking the question of, you know, what is chemical potential? Right, and so what this is getting at is one of the issues with chemical potential is I have no idea physically what the heck it is. Right? We know it's defined as uh, the partial molar gives free energy, but then you know what is molar gives free energy? Right? I don't have a you know Gibbs free energy meter in my laboratory that I can readily measure. Right? It's you know not a physical property that I have a good handle for in terms of what exactly it is, uh, how I can measure it, and things of that nature uh, in the laboratory. That's the link uh, that Fugacity will make in terms of connecting these abstract quantities uh, to the real world. Okay. And so, you know, additionally, besides just kind of this uh, physical limitation of what is chemical potential, okay, we're also going to flash back to Chapter 5 and look at one of the mathematical limitations of chemical potential, or molar Gibbs free energy. Again, remember, in the context of uh, pure component systems, molar Gibbs free energy and chemical potential are, are one and the same. Okay. So if we go back to the end of chapter 5, uh, here's my expression for the uh, differential of the dimensionless molar Gibbs free energy. So dg over rt is v over rt dp minus h over rt squared uh, dt. Okay. So if you recall, for a process at constant temperature, dt is 0, that goes away, and we have dg over rt is equal to v over rt dp. And for the case of an ideal gas, well, pv equals rt, so V is equal to RT over P, and we get that the differential of G over RT is just equal to DP over P. Okay. So what we're going to do next is we're going to integrate this expression from uh, the ideal gas limit to a pressure of interest. So remember, at constant T, in the limit that P goes to zero or V goes to infinity, all systems approach ideal gas behavior. Right? So at constant T, right, we're already assuming constant T. So if I'm riding along on an isotherm, in the limit that P goes to zero or V goes to infinity, I approach the ideal gas limit. Okay, So we're going to integrate from P equals zero, this ideal gas limit, to P. Okay, So in doing so, I get you know the integral of zero to P at dP over P, which is equal to log P uh, minus log of P at the limit that P goes to zero, which is negative infinity. Okay, So the issue is we must have that, you know, the differential or the dimensionless molar Gibbs free energy in the limit that p goes to zero or the ideal gas limit is equal to negative infinity. Okay, and since all fluids approach ideal gas behavior in the limit that p goes to zero, since this is true for the case of an ideal gas, it has to be true for and you know fluid in general. So in general, then it has to be true that g over rt in the limit that p goes to zero is equal to negative infinity. Okay. So one of our challenges with molar Gibbs free energy, and you could replace this with chemical potential because um, they're equivalent for a pure component system, is that it is indeterminate in the ideal gas limit. Right? In the ideal gas limit, it's equal to negative infinity. Okay? And so that's problematic right? in terms of um, you know, just uh, you know, this, this physical limit of this property uh, that I'm ultimately interested in for determining phase coexistence. All right. And so next I'm going to take a picture from um, you know, John Prousance's thermodynamic textbook, which is one of my favorites. And so the way Prousance lays things out is, you know, as chemical engineers, we have this problem to solve in the real world. Right? I have a mixture of ethanol and water that I want to separate by distillation, and I want to know the composition of those two components in the two phases of leaving my column. Right? I have this real world problem that I want to solve. Okay? So this real world problem that I want to get an answer of. And so kind of the general you know, uh, way that we solve these things or these thermodynamic problems is, you know, oh, wrong way. You know, step one, we're going to take our problem from the real world and we're going to um, you know, map it out to this extract world of mathematics and pure thermodynamics. Okay? And then once we've mapped out our problem in step one to this extract world of mathematics and thermodynamics, we then need to solve it. Okay? Uh, again, sorry, I hit the wrong way. Okay, so step two is essentially solving this uh, problem. Okay, and you know, with the work of Gibbs, essentially he 
you know, solved for step one and two. But the problem is, is when we solve a problem using Gibson thermodynamics, we solve it in this abstract world, right? We have these quantities like molar Gibbs free energy, chemical potential, where again, I, I really don't have a physical sense of what they are. Okay, and so where we left off and gives his gift to the world is essentially he solves for step one and two in terms of solving problems in phase equilibria, where we have the machinery in which we could take our problem and we can map it to this abstract world of thermodynamics, and then in theory we can solve it, but then we solve it and we're left with these abstract quantities that I can't readily connect uh, back to the real world. Okay, And so the last piece of the puzzle, the step three, is what we'll talk about next when we introduce fugacity, is after we've, in theory, solved this problem in this abstract world, is how do we translate it back to get an answer in the real world uh, and calculate things like mole fractions. Okay, so this is the step three that we're going to focus on next. And the person that's going to solve step three for us, or the person that we'll attribute it to, is uh, Gilbert uh, Newton-Lewis. Uh, if you don't know who Gilbert Newton-Lewis is, I would recommend that you go and check out his Wikipedia page. He's often called the greatest chemist to never have won a Nobel Prize. And for us as chemical engineers, he's the person that really made the connection of how we take thermodynamics and actually use it to solve real applicable problems, phase equilibrium problems um, of interest. All right, so what Gilbert did is he said, okay, I'm gonna go back to my uh, differential of the dimensionless molar Gibbs free energy, okay? And if I again consider the case of a system at constant temperature, I have the differential of G over RT is equal to V over RT dP. And once again, for the case of an ideal gas, I can simplify this by plugging in the ideal gas equation of state so PV equals RT, or V is RT over P, which gets me that the dimensionless G over RT is equal to 1 over PDP. And if I were to integrate this from a pressure of interest, or from a reference pressure at P naught, so a system at reference pressure P naught to a system at a pressure of interest, okay, and again, these are both at you know, a given temperature, I get that G minus G naught is equal to RT log P over P naught. Okay? So remember, in getting this expression, we make the assumption that we're at constant T. So this would correspond to my molar Gibbs free energy at my temperature and reference pressure. This would correspond to my molar Gibbs free energy at the same temperature and my pressure of interest. And then this is my log ratio of uh, P uh, and my reference uh, pressure. Okay. But again, uh, remember we have an isothermal process. Okay. Uh, so this is great. So for the case of an ideal gas, what this does is it takes this difference in this abstract quantity, molar Gibbs free energy, uh, which again is indeterminate in the ideal gas limit. It takes the difference in this abstract thermodynamic quantity and relates it to the log ratio of pressure. Right? And pressure is great. It is a physical quantity that I can readily measure and I understand what the heck it means. So if we were to generalize this to mixture, again, we could do the same thing in a mixture. Uh, what would happen in a mixture, though, uh, is, again, it would just be an isothermal process. Molar Gibbs free energy would be equivalent to chemical potential. Right? And so we'd have the difference in chemical potential uh, between two states at the same temperature. Okay? They're at the same temperature. They need not be at the same pressure or composition. It's equal to RT log ratio of uh, P1 over P1 naught. Okay, so this is for a pure component system. We write the equivalent if we're a mixture, and then we would need to throw in partial pressure, but uh, we'll come to that in due time. Okay, so I can write this in terms of molar Gibbs free energy. I can write it in terms of chemical potential. Okay, significance is I take the difference in these two abstract, or this difference in this uh, abstract quantity at two different states, and I relate it to a physical property I know and understand. Okay, so that's great, okay? The limitation of this, though, is it's limited to uh, the case of an ideal gas, right? So for an ideal gas, we have this beautiful expression. Uh, so for an isothermal process, I can relate a change in this abstract quantity to a log ratio of this physical quantity I know and love, but it's restricted to an ideal gas. So what Gilbert attempted to do is to generalize it, okay? And so he generalized it by introducing a new auxiliary function called fugacity. Okay. And so he said as well, for any fluid, okay, for any fluid, let's take 
the difference in chemical potential or molar Gibbs free energy for a pure component system. So that, that difference um, between two states at the same temperature, so for an isothermal process, and write it as being RT log ratio of fugacity. Fugacity in my state of interest relative to the fugacity um, at uh, that same uh, reference state. Okay, so at my same, well, they're both at the same temperature, so these two states are at the same temperature, um, but at my, you know, for the pure component system, um, my reference pressure. Okay, so we have chemical potential relative to, we would call this a reference state, the value at the same temperature, but some other pressure for a pure component system. Uh, and then it's equal to RT log ratio of fugacity. This corresponds to the same state as mu1, and F1 naught would be my reference state fugacity, which is at the same state as uh, mu1 naught. Okay, cool. So in order for this to be consistent with our equation, which is true for the case of an ideal gas, it must be that for an ideal gas, my fugacity is just equal to pressure. Okay, and so how we write this out is, you know, again, for the case of you know, mixture, is we know at constant temperature, these are for isothermal processes, at constant temperature and the limit that P goes to zero, all fluids approach ideal gas behavior. So in the limit then that P goes to zero, my fugacity is just equal to pressure, right? Or how we write it out is in the limit that uh, P goes to zero, the ratio of my fugacity uh, and for a mixture partial pressure, if it's a pure component system pressure, and the limit that P goes to zero, they just goes to one, right? It's, for the case of an ideal gas, fugacity is just equal to pressure, and that has to be true for this equation to be consistent with the one on the previous screen for the case of an ideal gas, okay? And so what we typically do is we can, um, you know, in, so in the limit that P goes to zero, in the ideal gas limit, my fugacity is just equal to pressure. And so what we do then is we typically rewrite my fugacity is being equal to, we define a fugacity coefficient times, for the case of a mixture, partial pressure, or for a pure component system, it would be the pressure, okay? So remember, in the limit that I have an ideal gas, then my fugacity is just equal to the partial pressure if it's a mixture, or my pressure then if it's just a pure component system, okay? So this gives me essentially the fugacity of an ideal gas, and so I'm writing my fugacity then as this correction factor, times fugacity of this idealized state, which in this case is an ideal gas. Correction factor times fugacity of that idealized state. Excellent, okay? So now this gives some significance to this quantity phi, this fugacity coefficient that we're introducing, is that's gonna account for deviations from this ideal gas limit. Cool, okay? And since in the limit, in the ideal gas limit, my fugacity is just equal to partial pressure for a mixture, okay? It must be then that in the ideal gas limit, or in the limit that I have an ideal gas, that my fugacity coefficient is just equal to one, okay? So the limit that P goes to zero, V goes to one, okay? So cool, all right? So this is what makes fugacity so useful. It's well bound, related to physical quantity. It could be viewed as a correction term to an idealized state, right? And you know, I have pressure in here, so fugacity is often called a, a corrected pressure. Um, but uh, yeah. All right, so just as a side note, uh, Lewis also gave us activity, which could be defined in a number of different ways, but it's the same sort of thing, right? So you know, we said that on you know, this last slide, my fugacity is equal to you know, this fugacity coefficient times the fugacity of an idealized state, okay? And so what we do here is if I were to multiply both sides by fi naught, Right, my fugacity of my idealized state is mole fraction xi times fi naught, the fugacity of my um, reference state. Right, and so it's the same sort of thing where my activity coefficient accounts for deviations from this idealized state, um, which in this case is uh, however you're defining an ideal solution. Right, so you know we'll we'll get to that in liquids. Okay, in in, in due time. Okay, but. Uh, yeah, so now if I look at my criteria of phase coexistence, we could write it as equality of temperatures, pressures, and chemical potentials, okay? Um, so we could just as well use fugacity. So in general, you know, for an isothermal process, mu1 minus mu1 naught is equal to this RT log ratio of fugacities. So I could write an equivalent expression for phase one and two. At equilibrium, K 
chemical potential of species one of phase one is equal to the chemical potential of species one of phase two. So I could, you know, solve for mu one in phase one, mu one in phase two, and set those equal to each other. Okay. Well, we can look at two different cases that are going to result in the same solution. If we assume that the two um, phases adopt the same uh, standard state, um, then you know my reference state chemical potentials and fugacities are the same, and we would just get left with my equality of chemical potentials could be rewritten as an equality of fugacities. Okay. Or the other way to write it is if they don't adopt uh, the same as so if the standard states of the two um, phases are at the same temperature and you know essentially they have to be right and why I say they have to be is you know we defined you know fugacity you know um, in terms of an isothermal process so my you know chemical potential and my reference state chemical potential potential have to be at the same temperature okay and then since that coexistence my two phases are at the same temperature their reference states have to be at the same temperature okay so case two you know it has to be true okay and you know, if you were to go this route um, well then we could take advantage of the you know exact relationship that differences in chemical potentials at a constant temperature could be rewritten as a log ratio of fugacities okay uh, and so that leads to a nice cancellation of terms right so that would you know say that the difference in these two terms if I bring it over is equal to if I bring this uh, fugacity term over if I break up my log um, they kill each other and we're left with just uh, the fugacities have to be equal to each other right and so you know all this is getting at is we could take our criteria of chemical equilibria and we can rewrite that as an equality of fugacities uh, rather than an equality of chemical potentials, right? I like fugacity because, again, it's this, you know, um, well-defined uh, quantity related to, you know, physical measurable uh, pressure. And we saw for the case of a mixture, right, I could take F and I could expand it out for um, as phi times yi times p, right? And so, you know, where that's going to become useful is when we talk about mixtures, is when I design a distillation column, you know, I don't care about things like, you know, Gibbs free energy, fugacity, or the like. What I care about is what's the compositions of my stream leaving that separation process, right? And so fugacity is going to give us a direct relationship to uh, concentration, which is what we really ultimately want to solve for, okay? And so though in the, in the case of chapter um, seven, this first half of the book, we're just interested in pure component systems. So for pure component systems, you know, mole fraction is essentially just one. So if I expand out my fugacity, it's just fugacity coefficient times pressure. Pressure, the two phases are equal to each other. Um, so for the case of a pure component system, we could rewrite my equality of fugacities or isofugacity criteria as equality of fugacity coefficients. Okay? But again, this is only true for the case of pure component systems where the mole fraction uh, in both phases is just one. Okay? When we get to mixtures later on in the second half of the book, we'll have a you know, composition here where, if, say, this is a vapor phase, it'd be yi, and if this is liquid phase, it'd be uh, composition xi, right? Mole fraction of vapor and mole fraction of liquid. And then this gives us a route where, hey, these are my criteria of phase coexistence, right? I can set up a problem now where I could explicitly solve for concentrations, the quantity I'm ultimately interested in when designing a separation process. Excellent.